When I was 13, my mom and dad let me go trick-or-treating for the first time without any supervision. All these years later, I can still remember how psyched I was that I was allowed out on my own for the first time. But little did I know, it would prove to be my first and last time trick-or-treating on my own. So at around 5.30, me and a few of my middle school buddies all got together and started walking from house to house. But we were faced with something of a problem. Some of the fancier houses, the ones with spookier decor, were so jammed up with kids that some had literal lines forming down the driveways. So, not wanting to line up for our candy, we figured we'd be smart and knock on the houses that no one else was knocking at. This was not a smart idea for obvious reasons, as the houses with no decorations sometimes just tell you to get lost or pretend not to be home at all. Anyway, we knock on this one house and instead of getting some grouchy grown-ups, some kid the same age as us answers the door. We didn't recognize him from school or from hanging around the neighborhood, so we're kind of confused like, trick or treat? All before the kid just slams the door in our face. Feeling suitably rejected, a few of us go to just walk back down the driveway, but one of my friends is like, nah, screw this kid, and knocks on the door again. The kid answers and my buddy sings, trick or treat, before striking this dumb pose as if to be like, screw you. The kid then absolutely explodes and screams like, you knock on my house again and I'll kill you, before slamming the door again. Again, most of us are like, dude, let's just go. But this one friend of mine is basically like, oh, it's on. Shoves his finger into the house's doorbell and keeps it there, resulting in this long, solid burr sound. Even over the buzzer, you could hear the kid running back towards the door from the other side. Only this time when he opens it up, he has this huge, gnarly-looking blade in his hand, like a sacrificial dagger in design, but at least the length of his forearm. As soon as we see it, we just bolt up the driveway and out into the street, but I kid you not, this kid follows us. We managed to maintain a steady distance between us as we ran, and the kid wasn't all that fast of a runner. But in all of our dumb costumes, we couldn't run as fast as normal, so we're in serious danger of maybe tripping, falling, or just slowing down enough for this psycho knife kid to catch up to us. I think the worst part was when we saw some lady taking out some trash and we ran to her for help. She just looked at us like we were playing a prank. And then when she saw the knife, she just bolts back indoors too. I swear to God, that was the worst feeling thinking, my God, no one's going to help us. Then, I remember seeing the fastest of us like swerving over to some house on one side of the street where we were running down. Then, only when I got a little closer did I realize he was bolting into an open garage. We all follow and we manage to pull the manual door down just in time to shut out the knife kid who then starts kicking the garage door. This summons the homeowner into the garage who's obviously like, what are you doing here? But once we explain the situation, the guy runs off to call the cops. We're still in the garage, shaking and panting, still terrified the kid is going to break into the guy's home somehow. But the next time the homeowner reappeared in the garage, he has his cell phone in one hand and a gun in the other. Only then did I actually start to feel safe. Like I'm not even a gun guy or anything like that, but I saw that thing and just thought, okay, if the kid gets in, he's done. And in the moment, that actually calmed me down. Kind of scary that it did, but we move on. Anyways, the cops showed up pretty quick which meant we had the pleasure of watching that stupid psycho get slammed into the pavement. Kind of a sad story in a way because we heard the kid was super neglected by his parents and that he had a bunch of mental problems too. His parents used to leave him alone for weeks at a time because they traveled a bunch for work. Kind of like if Kevin from Home Alone had just suddenly lost his mind or something. I feel for the kid in a way, but honestly, he was lucky he didn't get shot either by the homeowner or by the cops. And we all hate that kid to this day because, after that, we weren't allowed to go trick-or-treating until we were way too old for it anyway.
Halloween night. I'm 12 years old, growing up in Fontana, California. I'd arranged to ride my bike over to my friend's house. We'd go trick-or-treating in his neighborhood and then ride back home with my candy by 8.30. All goes to plan. I get a fat sack of minis and I'm riding my bike back along the sidewalk. I come across this guy leaning up against a wall, lit up by a streetlight. He's smoking a cigarette, wearing a dark hoodie, and as I get near him, he looks at me and calls out like, Nice costume, kid. Then steps out into the sidewalk to check out my costume and ask me about it. He was being real friendly and I was way naive so it's not like alarm bells were going off. He then asked for some of my candy and only then was I worried that I might actually take any of it. I'd have been absolutely heartbroken if I'd gone to all that effort only to get jacked for my candy on the way home. So, I reached into my bag, pull out a few minis and then hand them over. This seems to satisfy him and he thanks me for asking what my costume was. My last memory is of me explaining who Nightwing is and then the next thing I remember... I'm waking up on the concrete and my legs hurt. I turn my head and see my legs are all wrapped up in a bike frame, but I also see the same dude who stopped me pull out a knife and be like, give me the bike. I'm so dizzy and stuff that I have to like kick the bike away from me just so he could take it and I realize then that I'm on the floor because the guy knocked me out somehow. I'm guessing with a sucker punch or whatever because I could taste blood in my mouth. He picks my bike up and I somehow find my feet, and I know I should have been scared, but I was only so hazy that I honestly couldn't feel anything but just like a resigned numbness. The whole thing only really hit me when the guy told me to take my shoes off. I had these sick Nike Air Maxes on that were my brothers, navy blue and perfect for the Nightwing costume. They weren't mine, so I told the guy no, and I couldn't give them away because they were my big brothers. That's when the guy hit me again and although it didn't knock me out, it definitely knocked me on my butt. Then as I'm sitting there, fighting back tears, he actually takes them off my feet, and I'm too scared and upset and mad that I just didn't do anything about it. I just let him. The whole time I'm thinking, this guy might stab me just because, so I just couldn't fight back at all. Then he says something like, I'll leave you with your candy though, like he's saying I'm a good guy really. Sure, I just knocked out a 12-year-old, but I'm a good guy at heart. It's one of the few things from my childhood slash teenage years that actually still really bugs me to this day, and I still remember walking home in my socks like it was yesterday. My mom and dad called the cops for me as soon as I got home, but they never caught the guy to my knowledge. Sick thing is, the guy is probably still out there, thinking he was a good guy for punching a 12-year-old, but leaving him with his candy. So I don't know if y'all remember, but in 2015, Halloween fell on a Saturday. I was 14 back then, first year of high school, and it turned out to be the last time we ever went trick-or-treating, so I'm glad we made the most of it. And we made the most of it by organizing a trick-or-treat sleepover party, i.e. we'd all get together, go trick-or-treating, then head back to our friend's place for the sleepover. So on Halloween night, we got given a curfew of 9.30 and we intended to use this spare time for something a little less wholesome. We planned a trick-or-treat until like 8pm, then after that, we'd head over to our high school. Why visit high school on a weekend, I hear you ask? Well, we knew the older kids had a place they'd sneak off to smoke cigarettes and we heard they kept a stash of nudie magazines somewhere around the same spot. And before you start going off about who has nudie magazines in the age of the internet, I got two words for you. Parental locks. Anyways, we head down there, start rustling around the bushes looking for the mags when one of my buddies walks off to find somewhere to pee. He comes back a minute or so later with this horrified look on his face like, run. Seeing that look on his face, we didn't ask any questions. We just ran as fast as we could until we were back under the relative safety of some nearby streetlights. We all stood there, panting as our buddy struggles to get out that he told us to run because when he was peeing, he looked around and saw some guy watching him go, and the guy was 
doing stuff to himself. We all accused him of trying to pull a prank on us at first, but in hindsight, I think it was more that we didn't want to believe that it was true, as opposed to us actually not believing him. Like yeah, we pulled pranks on each other all the time, but nothing like that. Besides, you could just tell from his reaction that he wasn't kidding. We weren't exactly the best actors, and if this whole act was just a performance, it was Oscar winning. So, as much as the official line was that he was trying to just scare us, we all had our suspicions that he was telling the truth. Like when one of us suggested that we go back because he'd probably just spooked himself somehow, he was adamant that we'd just go right back to the sleepover. I mean, he told us he'd walk back to our buddy's house alone if that was what it took. Anyway, it was pretty intense, but we moved on from it pretty quickly. Even the kid who apparently saw the guy just did his best to forget about it. Amazing how easy you can compartmentalize stuff at that age. Then, like a year later the following summer, a kid goes missing two towns over. It was a whole thing. Missing posters and TV appeals. And I remember feeling so bad for the family. Then, when the cops found someone they wanted to talk to, they go to his house and he pulls out a gun. Cue a three-hour standoff that ends with cops trying to bust into his home and the guy shooting himself when they did. They never found the kid who went missing. Long story short, my buddy thinks it's the same guy who was watching him pee that night we were trick-or-treating. And as much as I don't want to, I think I actually believe him. I don't think he'd ever make something up like that and honestly, sometimes I think my friend was only a hair's breadth away from being the kid that no one ever found. About ten years ago now, I was living in my first real apartment and it was Halloween night. I lived on the ground floor and we had a bunch of neighborhood kids walking around the complex, going from apartment to apartment and collecting candy. It was kind of annoying after a while, I'll be honest. I was trying to play Modern Warfare 2 and getting up every 5 minutes to give out candy was seriously messing with my KD. So in the end, I just put the bowl of candy outside with a little sign that said, help yourself, and then went back to gaming. About a half hour goes by with no knocking so I'm pretty pleased with this until, out of nowhere, I hear someone knocking on my apartment door. I figured some kid had just stole the entire bowl and here was the next set of kids wondering if they could get some candy. Either way, I'm thinking like, nope, not answering it. But whoever it is keeps knocking over and over again like they're just not stopping. So I get up and rummage through my kitchen to try to find something sweet to give the kids. And then when I head to the door, I open up to see that all the candy is still right there in the bowl. Well, most of it anyway, and the kids are still knocking. It's then that I look down and see this one kid had to be maybe seven or eight years old and he's holding one of his sneakers in his hand standing on one leg and there's this little drip 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 of blood coming off his foot before i could even ask one of the kids says like my friend hurt his foot could we have a band-aid please of course i asked the kids to come inside prop the one kid on the chair to see his foot turns out he stood on a nail or something that's gone right up through the sole because because he has this perfectly round little poke wound that was bleeding something fierce. Now I wanted to call 911, but at the same time I'm thinking, what if I burden some family with medical bills they can't afford? So instead, I ask if any of their parents are around, and the wounded kid says his dad was out in the neighborhood with them, but they don't know where he is now. I then ask the non-wounded kid to go find the wounded kid's dad and bring him to my apartment. Okay, they say, and off they go. In the meantime, I give the kids some candy, clean up their foot as best I can, and put wrap and gauze around the kid's foot. I know, I'm not exactly an EMT, but I feel so bad for them. It was just this little boy, just fighting so hard not to cry in front of his buddies. And my God, was he doing a good job of it too. Anyways, like five minutes later, someone starts banging on my door. Not knocking, banging on my door. I know it has to be the kid's dad, and I figured he was just agitated because who wouldn't be, but when I opened the door, 
this absolute unit of a guy just launches himself at me, then throws me against a wall. Guy's a total skinhead, at least three bills, and couldn't have been an inch before 6'5". Like he could have eaten me alive in one gulp if he wanted to, and he's screaming in my face, Where's my kid? Tell me where my kid is or I'll freaking kill you. You understand me? I could barely get a word out. I just pointed into the TV room and we both just heard his kid say, Dad? He looks back in the direction of the room, looks back at me and then runs into the TV room to check on his kid. I'm too scared to walk into the room and I'm just standing there in the hallway as the guy asks his kid, What did that guy do to you? Tell me right now. The kid starts crying, not being able to get his words out, which was freaking agony because I'm thinking, Tell him, kid. Tell him I'm a good guy. But I think the kid was so worried that they were in trouble that all they could do was burst into tears. Every second that went by, that guy was gearing up closer and closer to kill me. You could just see it in his face. And in the end, I had to jump in to explain what had happened. That his kid had cut his foot and all that had happened is that he had knocked at my apartment to get some medical attention. The dad only believed me when his kid started nodding along with what I was saying. Turns out those kids I sent to look for his dad basically told him two things. One, your son is hurt. And two, that he's in some strange guy's apartment. That's when the guy puts two and two together to make five, then just zooms over to my apartment to rip my head off. Once the guy calmed down, he apologized and offered me 50 bucks out of his wallet to say, thank you. I know I should have just taken that idiot's money, but honestly, I think I had like Stockholm Syndrome at the time or something because I rationalized the whole confrontation away like, of course the guy wants to keep his kids safe from weirdos. I guess I just never understood what the phrase, no good deed goes unpunished until that night and, and honestly, I just wanted to get back to playing Modern Warfare 2. I used to do a lot of babysitting work in my teenage years and one Halloween I got an offer good enough that I legitimately cancelled my party plans. Not my party obviously, and I won't brag by telling you how much I got but the family's first choice cancelled last minute and they were desperate. Anyway, the job is a dream one, the kid is adorable and there's minimal trouble at bedtime. Then after the kid fell asleep, I'm left to kill some time in the usual way, watching TV texting, ordering pizza, etc. Anyway, since it was Halloween, I'm watching a few spooky movies and shows on TV. Shout out to the Treehouse of Horror Marathon on Fox. Then all of a sudden, I start hearing something talking in another room. Now bear in mind that I think I'm home alone there, so hearing another voice while knowing the kid was asleep. Jesus Christ, I remember how my heart raced all those years later. It wasn't even just normal talking or whispering either, but this low, almost demonic voice speaking to another one. Ugh, it put the fear of God directly into me, I swear. I just jumped in, ran to the kitchen to grab the cordless phone and a knife, and then started edging towards the room I heard the voices coming from. The whole time I'm like, I need to protect this kid. But the fear of knowing I was going to be the first one to get got was honestly one of the worst things I've ever felt. Then right as I hear, 911, what's your emergency? And I know the dispatcher will hear whatever has happened. I burst in the room with the intruders, brandishing the knife and shouting, I got the cops on the fu- Furbies. It was Furbies talking to each other in the middle of the night, in the dark. I had to explain to the dispatcher that there had been a horrible mistake and that I was so, so sorry. I honestly thought that they'd be mad that I called for a false alarm, but the nice lady explained it's better to be safe than sorry and then hung up. Definitely the single scariest thing that's ever happened to me on a babysitting job, and yes, I am embarrassed. But I'll never forget that feeling of vulnerability and still knowing I had a responsibility to protect someone. Anyway, it all worked out in the end because... I admitted the whole thing to the kid's parents when they arrived home, just in case the cops called by to warn them about the calling. They didn't, obviously, and I was just paranoid they would and that I might end up losing any future work from these two. Luckily, they were actually kind of impressed that I'd protected their daughter like that. 
and only ever called me in the future when they needed someone to babysit. So, all's well that ends well, I guess. I live out in the country, more woods and fields around me than houses, and back in the day when we went trick-or-treating on Halloween, we basically walk about three miles to knock on maybe ten houses. Luckily, all the surrounding families compensated by giving out about buckets full of sweets, and we still had to walk around dark fields to get at them. So, around where we lived, there were several dirt paths through the woods that farmers used for their tractors and all that during the day. Me and my friends used to use these paths because they're usually quiet and have no traffic unlike the road. So on Halloween night, when we're all about 15, it had rained during the day so the paths were all muddy. We'd collected a fair amount of chocolate, so we're heading back, just messing around when we just so happened to go in a big loop so we could stay out longer. That's the best way of describing it anyway because the point is, we were able to follow our own footprints through the mud knowing we'd been the only people walking that way. Or so we thought because as we're following them, we see this much larger pair of footprints that appear from the tree line and seem to follow us for a bit. We were definitely a bit creeped out by this but it didn't mean they were following us. But then we saw that when we walked back into our loop, the bigger footprints followed us and that basically, whoever it was must have still been behind us. That was a pretty chilling moment, honestly, and we all agreed to just stop messing around and walk home as soon as possible. And then right as we do, we hear something moving in the darkness behind us. I felt the tension creeping right up my spine as we all just stood there, too scared to move, just waiting for something terrible to happen. But thankfully, we were able to get home without incident. We never actually saw anyone, no one attacked us or anything, but that sensation that came after realizing we were being followed is one I'll never forget, especially with it having happened on Halloween of all nights, too. This happened when I was like 11 years old and I was eating all the candy I'd gotten from trick-or-treating in front of the TV. I also had this thing where I'd like to put a bunch of Skittles in my mouth, chew them up, then make like a Skittle ball that I would chew on. Gross, I know, but will I apologize for it? The heck I will. Anyways, something on the show I was watching made me laugh and swallow the ball, which got lodged in my throat. I then experienced a few seconds of absolute terror because I realized I couldn't actually call for help and that I was probably going to die. Thankfully, my dad heard me knocking something off a countertop and came running in to help. He grabbed me, put me in a Heimlich maneuver thingy, and I coughed that skittle ball right up as I felt like I was going to pass out. It was super lucky because I really had no idea what I was doing, but one of the worst feelings I'd ever experienced. Definitely never ate Skittles that way again after that, and to this day, I'm still a bit paranoid about eating certain things when alone. Back when I was 12, me and my buddies got to go trick-or-treating for the first time on our own. We had a curfew of 9pm sharp, and by around 8.30, we suddenly decided that we didn't have nearly enough candy for our liking. So we started going really quick from house to house, trying to cover as much ground as possible. When our watches hit 8.45, most of us are suggesting just call it a night, but I had my heart set on one more house. No one wanted to get into trouble, but I'm insisting, like, just one more house. Think of the candy. That's what tips the balance, so... We walk over to this one last house, up the driveway, and to the front door. I remember just instinctively pressing the doorbell, not even really looking at the door itself, so it took one of my friends to be like, Dude, look. I look and I see the front door is actually open. It was only ever so slightly ajar, but it was open. I gave my buddy a look as to say, What? But we didn't push the door open or anything. I just carried on buzzing the doorbell. 
like maybe it had been left open on purpose. Another one of us called out, hello, but we didn't hear anything back and we were just about to walk away when we heard something from inside the house. It sounded like a thud, like someone, I don't know, kicked a couch or something. Not a super alarming sound, but enough to have us stop, turn back, and wonder if we shouldn't maybe check it out or something. Again, one of us calls out, Hello? Is anyone there? Only this time, I stepped forward to push open the front door. What we saw was a long, cream-colored carpet with what was obviously blood on it. There was blood on the carpet and blood on the door and its handle. We all see it, and for a second, we're all just totally dumbstruck. Then one of us just sprints off in the direction of a neighbor's house and bangs on the door. Within about 20 minutes, the street outside is just flooded with blue and red flashing lights, and me and my buddies are sat on the curb outside answering some cops' questions. The worst part was when they wheeled someone out with a sheet over them, so we knew whoever's blood it was probably wasn't with us anymore. As you can imagine, our parents must have been pretty livid with us because we didn't get home until about 10.30. But since we were with cops, they knew something must have happened. I remember my dad kept checking the newspaper for any info, but all he could find was this tiny mention of a home invasion on Halloween. I guess the perps had knocked on the front door or maybe fooled the guy into thinking that they were trick-or-treaters. We didn't even get to save the guy. Like I was hoping that, yeah, our whole year had been messed up with this thing, but at least we get to take credit for saving somebody whenever the EMT showed up, but we didn't get there in time, and he must have bled out pretty quick. All that after me insisting one more house. Just one more house. Two years ago, I was driving home late from work on Halloween of all nights. I've been stuck in the office way, way later than usual, working the tight end of a project with a guy who had a job lined up elsewhere and had otherwise totally checked out. I was angry. The least he could do was be professional about it, and if he was mad at the firm, why take it out on me? Anyway, it's like 8pm, I'm starving, and admittedly, I'm doing about 50 in a 30. Then, out of nowhere, this little trick-or-treater steps out in front of my car, then freezes, legitimately like a deer in headlights, and just stares at me as I slam on the brakes. I was so sure I was about to hit her, and I know this is low, but I covered my eyes with my hands because I just couldn't bear to see this little girl kid get smashed. But then, by the time I stopped, I opened my eyes to see she's still standing there, she looks terrified and you can hardly blame her. So, I open my car door, step out just enough to talk to her and ask her if she's okay. She just sort of blinks at me and I assume she's just in shock, so I ask again. But yet again, she doesn't answer. She just sort of looks at me and doesn't say a word. Then, right as I'm about to ask her where her mom and dad are, this big black van, the kind with of a sliding door appears out of nowhere and skids to a stop next to her. The middle door slides open and a man gets out and I think this might be the kid's family or something but the way the guy grabbed her, the way the girl screamed when the strange man picked her up, it gave me the distinct impression that whatever just happened was far from wholesome. I found somewhere to pull over, took out my cell phone and immediately called the cops. I told them everything, what the girl looked like, what her costume looked like, the make and model of the van along with as much of the license plate as I could remember. I sat there in my car, eyes closed and tried to picture everything I saw in intimate detail. I assumed I'd be seeing something about it on the news, I mean, whenever a kid goes missing, especially a violent abduction or whatever, it's normally all over the news, right? Not this time. I didn't see a single mention of it anywhere. I tried searching online too and I didn't find a single report about black fans or child abductions anywhere around Kansas City. It makes me think I misunderstood what I saw. 
makes me doubt myself. Maybe the kid was just, I don't know, disabled in some way and gotten lost while trick-or-treating. There's a hundred different ways to rationalize it, but every time I remember the way the guy grabbed her and the way that kid screamed, I don't know. I think I witnessed something terrible and whoever's responsible had gotten away with it completely. When I was 11 years old, I took my little sister trick-or-treating in our neighborhood. Long story short, there was a lot of trouble back home between my mom, my dad, and my stepdad, this guy called Craig. Craig was a jerk, my mom was a drunk, and dad was fighting for custody of us. As you can imagine, it was incredibly stressful, and it definitely accounts for one of the most miserable times in my life. But that night's trick-or-treating ended with an absolute low point that I feel very lucky to have escaped. So I took my sister around the neighborhood and we did okay in terms of our candy haul. Then by curfew time I walked her back to our house where we found Craig was waiting for us. He looked livid but we weren't late coming back or anything so as my sister walked back into the house I gave her my bag of candy while Craig walked off toward the garage. I kept asking him what was going on but he wouldn't say anything to me and as he handed me some gloves, a shovel, and a trash bag, it felt a whole lot like I was being punished for something I didn't do. Then, as I followed him into the woods behind his house, I saw that he had a little hatchet in his hand. The last time I saw anyone with these items in tow, it was some neighbors going to butcher a deer that had been caught on their property. Poor thing had almost disemboweled itself on some razor wire and bled out during the night, and our neighbors must have had a heck of a time getting rid of it. So, as much as I'm kind of nervous about what's going to greet me at the end of our little walk, I couldn't have any idea how horrible it truly was. After about 10 to 15 minutes of walking, Craig tells me to stop and start digging a hole where I'm stood. I ask why and he tells me to shut up and do as I'm told, which wasn't out of the ordinary, but after only a few scoops of dirt, he stops me. He asks if I want to know why I'm digging and of course I told him yes, and he tells me that I'm actually digging my own grave. I thought it might have been a Halloween prank or something. One in bad taste, sure, but a prank nonetheless. Then he starts telling me about how my dad has a custody hearing coming up in two weeks and that it's my job to make sure that he doesn't win. If he did win, the hole I was in the middle of digging would become my grave. I was 11, dude. 11 years old. And this grown man is telling me how I need to, like, stop some entire legal proceeding or whatever. That, or he'd kill me, presumably with the hatchet he had in his hand. After that, we picked up all the stuff we'd brought out with us, then walked back to the house. All these years later, parts of me wonder why I didn't react more viscerally to actually being threatened with murder. I didn't cry. I didn't run. I just sort of accepted it. I imagine this is what my therapist calls my childhood traumas and that I was just so burned out with the abuse and fear and the misery that I just took it in my stride. But I'm sure you'll all be pleased to hear that my dad ended up winning custody purely on the basis of him not having any kind of criminal record while my mom's and Craig's rap sheet was like a mile long. Craig wasn't so smart either as when the judge ruled in my dad's favor, me and my sister went right home with him. We never saw Craig again, and since my mom refuses to leave him, I haven't actually seen my mom since the hearing. We've talked on the phone a bunch, but I've no desire to see her in person. Not if Craig is still around. I grew up in a place called Fells Point in Baltimore. It's like an old Polish neighborhood, mostly low to middle income housing, but it's about a 15 to 20 minute walk away from Mount Vernon and the Arts District, which is where some of the nicest neighborhoods in the city are. Back when we were kids, I'm talking like maybe 9 to 13 years old, our parents wouldn't let us trick or treat anywhere too far away from Fells Point or Little Italy. 
but first year of high school, right when we're on the cusp of being too old to even trick or treat in the first place, our parents tell us we're allowed to go out unsupervised and with a later curfew. By us, I mean my friend Nick and my friend George. We know we have to make the most of this newfound freedom, which is when George comes up with a plan that we all thought was a pure masterstroke of genius. Instead of trick-or-treating around some broke neighborhood, we could walk over to Mount Vernon and farm all the rich people candy instead. I mean, in actual fact, we've found the nicer neighborhoods to be even less down with Halloween than friggin' Greek town, but at the time, we got it into our dumb heads that we'd be getting like full-size candy bars, whole bags of loose candies, dumb ideas like that. So, we got into our costumes, then met up on the corner before heading over to Mount Vernon. But before we left, Nick stops us, puts on some cartoonishly spooky voice and says something like, May the dark Lord Satan bless our journey, brothers. George, whose parents were like hardcore Greek Orthodox and brought him up the same way, starts trying to give Nick a stinger telling him to stop invoking the name of Satan and stuff. We just started laughing, and he always thought that Christian stuff made him look righteous when, in reality, it just gave away that he was a total mama's boy. Anyway, the more George is getting mad at all the Satan stuff, the more Nick is doing it, and almost every time we got candy around Mount Vernon, Nick would wait until the person had shut their door before being like, Hail Satan, brothers. The Dark Lord provides. It was super funny, and seeing George almost burst a blood vessel every time he said it was even funnier. So we're just walking the streets of Mount Vernon, running out of doorbells to ring, lots of art galleries and other stuff eating up whole blocks there, when we have an idea. The whole time, we hadn't been walking past anything that even resembled an apartment building. We'd have to buzz someone to let us in, and hope the person whose buzzer we pushed had some Halloween spirit about them. You get it. It wasn't an ideal trick-or-treat setup. But given we were running out of real estate and we were still entertaining this idea of there being these stashes of super candy or whatever, we decided to roll the dice on it. We walked down the path of one while we're studying the windows to see if anyone has any Halloween decorations on show. Nick just walks up to the little push pad thing and just mashes all the buttons. Lo and behold, a few seconds later the door to the apartment buzzes and audibly unlocks. Somebody's always expecting somebody, I remember Nick saying. I know we got that from a movie, I just can't remember which one. Anyway, once we get inside the building we start knocking on apartment doors, getting told to buzz off by most people and by the third floor, we're getting pretty tired of walking up each flight of stairs. That's when George has the bright idea of catching the elevator up to the top floor then working our way down. Trust the fat kid to come up with that one necessity being the mother of invention and all that. So, we get in the elevator, which was a little sketchy, but otherwise okay looking, and hitched a ride to the top floor. This place only had like eight or nine floors, or lazy sewer, so it was a very brief ride to the top of the building. But for the 30 seconds or so that we're in the elevator, Nick is putting on this deep voice, rolling his eyes, holding his hands out in front of him like a wizard or something and being like, Hail Satan, may his candy gifts be bountiful. George just loses it, punches him in the arm and starts yelling at him about how he shouldn't be messing with things like that. The elevator reaches the ninth floor. Nick says, whatever, then goes to step out. But George grabs him by the arm, pulls him back and starts shouting at him. And I swear to God about if he keeps talking about Satan and... Right when he says Satan, the freaking elevator just dropped into free fall for like a split second before stopping again. It was enough of a drop that maybe only like half of the opening was still visible, but my god, did we freak out. Scrambling out through the opening that remained, each assuming it'd be us the elevator dropped on. We all got out okay and the elevator didn't drop anymore, but we were just out of our minds, man. People were coming out of their apartments to see what all the fuss was about and then asking who let us in. It was a whole thing. Then one of the residents made a comment about calling the cops to have us taken home. We all just made a break for the stairwell. Like it probably would have been a good idea to get a ride home, but we were just so on edge after the whole elevator thing that 
we just bailed as soon as anyone mentioned 911. After that, we all went our separate ways and dealt with the trauma alone for the night. I want to make it clear at this point that I totally understand what happened was nothing more than a total fluke. Yeah, it was really freaking scary, but I don't think anything supernatural was at play. It doesn't matter if it was Halloween, and it doesn't matter that Nick was hailing Satan all night. But that's not what George thinks, no siree. I mean, some of you might have been able to guess that George saw the whole thing as a huge affirmation of faith, and I wish I could say that he got tired of saying I told you so, but he didn't. The thing that gets me, though, is how instead of being like, don't be a baby, there's no such thing as Satan, Nick seemed to actually believe it. He never came out and said it, and it's not like he started going to church or anything, but he wasn't his usual cocky self whenever the subject came up and he always just went quiet whenever George suggested he had actually invoked Satan. Couple that with the fact he definitely picked up an interest in spirits and the beyond after the incident, and I don't know. I think Nick really did start believing that something else was at work that night. So me and my brothers have a weird relationship in that there are a whole 15 years between us. Yeah, you read that right. 15 years. Basically when our parents were like 20, 21, they had me by accident and waited until they were in their mid-30s to try for another kid. I think they were just so shell-shocked by my arrival that they didn't think they wanted any more. Well, they were wrong. I was like three months off being 16 when my mom welcomed baby Tyler into the world and as much as it was kind of weird having a baby brother at that age, it was actually kind of cool too. Mainly because my parents were too wrapped up in taking care of him to give me any strict discipline, but also because I got to kind of vicariously live my childhood again through Tyler. Okay, that might have come off sounding a little bit weird and... I'd like everyone with an image of me in an adult diaper to put it right out of their mind. Just put it this way, I got to go trick-or-treating again, like legitimately trick-or-treating, costume and all, way past when I thought I'd ever get to go again. The first time he really wanted to go was when he was either five or six, and when my mom asked if I wanted to take him around the neighborhood in this little Buzz Lightyear costume, I practically bit her hand off. Not only would I get to try out my Leon S. Kennedy cosplay, but I'd also be able to take a cut of Tyler's candy. Not a huge cut, just something to wet my beak, as that dude in Godfather 2 says. Anyway, I change up my costume last minute and get together a yellow shirt and cowboy hat, enough to pass myself as Woody from Toy Story, and that just about makes Tyler the happiest kid ever. Sure, I had to keep correcting people that he wasn't my kid, but it felt great to see my baby brother so happy. Then, maybe like 45 minutes or so into our little candy mining session, I noticed Tyler hasn't touched a single piece of candy. I turned to him to ask if anything was wrong or if he was saving everything for later. He replied that he was scared to eat any and when I asked him why, he said it was because a kid in kindergarten had told him that people give out poison candy. What kind of evil devil kid tells other kids that Halloween candies get poisoned? Or, I don't know... Maybe they believed it themselves, but either way, I was horrified. I wanted Tyler to enjoy Halloween just as much as I did. And I wasn't about to let some dumb rumor ruin his first spooky night. I stop, kneel down to his level, look him in the eyes, explain that everything that dumb kid said was complete nonsense. I then reach into his bag of candy, take out a Reese's cup, unwrap it, then put it in my mouth. It was legit adorable. He looked terrified for a second, but then as I started chewing and started making these theatrical yum noises, he started to loosen up. He then takes out a mini bag of M&Ms and starts shoveling them into his mouth with this look of pure joy on his face. So, thinking that problem was solved, we continue on our merry way. Cut to maybe 30 minutes later and we just rang at a house not too far from our own. We ring the doorbell. These older folks answer with a big bowl of candy in each of their hands, and we begin the old ritual of them telling Tyler how great he looked, asking him what his favorite candy is and all that good stuff. Then right as they're talking, 
I get this kind of dull ache in the upper right side of my abdomen. Nothing too unpleasant, but enough to have me gently massaging the area like, oof, definitely ate too much candy. But then, I hadn't eaten too much. I'd hardly eaten any at all. And as Tyler and the older folks continued their back and forth, this dull ache got more and more intense until all of a sudden, I get a pain so sharp that it literally had me doubled over, grunting from agony. The older couple are like, Are you feeling okay, young man? And I swear to God, I was in so much pain that I couldn't even answer them. It felt like someone had stuck a red-hot piece of metal into my side and was slowly twisting it. Obviously, the older couple had the good sense to call 911, but as soon as one of them mentioned it, I heard Tyler scream, Poison candy. I'll admit, I wasn't thinking rationally at the time. Intense amount of physical pain can do that to someone, but just for a second I thought Tyler might be right. I mean, I had literally zero clue what was going on. It really did feel like I was dying or something. And okay, spoilers, but it wasn't poison candy. I think that only ever happened one time with those poison pixie sticks or whatever and the rest is just an urban legend. What happened, though, was a gallbladder attack. Yep, I didn't know what a gallbladder attack was either, but please believe me when I tell you that it was the single worst pain I'd ever felt in my life. The EMTs shot me so full of painkillers in that ambulance that I had no idea what was going on by the time I got to the hospital. I was high as a kite. But honestly, anything seemed far better than feeling that kind of pain again. The doctor said I was the youngest person he'd ever seen have gallbladder problems and that it was partially due to my ongoing weight issues. He said unless I put myself on a diet and exercise routine to reduce my body mass or the gallbladder problems would be coming back. I had been meaning to do so for years but finding the motivation was always the hardest part. Trust me, there's no better motivation to go out on that walk or to skip the pancake breakfast than remembering how much pain I was in that Halloween night. But still, I'm just glad it wasn't actually poison candy, because the only thing scarier than gallbladder attacks is the idea of my baby brother growing to hate the best holiday of the year. This takes place at a Halloween party back in 1993. So my mom and auntie were at this Halloween party at a place called the Rising Sun Bar, a little function room slash pub in their hometown of Derry in Northern Ireland. They had just turned 18. This was going to be one of their first proper legal nights out, so they were obviously just ridiculously excited, and this excitement only got more and more intense as they dolled themselves up and got ready. It was sort of like a coming of age, and when they arrived, all the older folks were so happy to see these two young ladies becoming women. Anyway, as the night goes on, everyone was having a lovely time. The booze is flowing and the Halloween-themed tunes are thumping over the pub's PA system. People are in costumes. There's a prize for the best one. The whole night sounded just brilliant. Then suddenly, at about 10pm, a man walked into the bar in a rather unusual-looking costume and he just stood there for a moment, looking around the pub at all the people. My mom said it was like one of those record scratch moments where a person walks into the room and everyone kind of stops to look at them. The man is wearing a blue boiler suit and a balaclava, and he's soon joined by two other men dressed in similar attire. I don't think it was like the entire pub that stopped to look at him, nor did the music stop as he walked through the doors, but enough people were paying attention that they heard him shout, trick or treat at the top of his lungs. At that, they all pulled out guns and began firing into the crowd. Mum said it was absolute chaos. There was glass shattering, people falling, everyone was screaming or crying over fallen friends or relatives. I think the only reason they survived was because they had ran behind the bar when all the shooting started going off. Then suddenly, as quickly as the whole thing had started, the gunmen were gone. They killed eight people that night and wounded just short of twenty others. They destroyed people's lives, changed others forever. 
all as part of some tit-for-tat revenge thing with the local branch of the IRA. I'm glad most of that stuff is behind us now, but it still threatens to rear its ugly head every so often. I just hope that we, as a people, have the good sense to leave that kind of thing behind us, so that no one ever has to hear the words trick-or-treat again and actually fear for their life. They caught the blokes that done it too, but the political situation here is so dire that they ended up getting released early as part of the peace agreement. God knows where they are now, but that's just one of the really scary things about living in this island. There are all kinds of monsters walking around, ones that should still be locked up behind bars. But they're free to walk around like they're as good as you and me, and I promise you, if you could have been back in that bar to see what my mom saw, you'd know they deserved anything but freedom. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and have a very happy and safe trick-or-treating.